Good evening, friends. Welcome to class number 43. Uh, as you noticed, I hope, on the Facebook announcement or in the email, if you received an email, if you're on the distribution list, um, this uh, we will meet every week at the same time until we're through going over the Book of Certitude. <clears throat> simply for the reason that will become apparent as we do it, but there's just so much there. And uh, as we will discuss later tonight, the Book of Certitude is the foremost doctrinal work in the Baha'i writings, and it is the second most important work in the Baha'i writings, the most holy book of uh, the Kitabi Agdas being the most important work uh, strategically. But in so far as the description of Baha'i concepts of uh, the manifestation, progressive revelation, all the essential uh, concepts in the faith are presented in the Kitabi Gan. And uh, so you would think that it would be in the context of the Baha'i teachings, which say that there will not be another manifestation or another religion for at least a thousand years, that you could correctly say that uh, the Book of Certitude is the most important work for the next thousand years. So we'd be kind of foolish, especially if we are Baha'is, not to read it and read it pretty carefully. Uh, I'm, we're not going to go through it word for word, but we are going to go through it point for point in a, in a manner that uh, will become apparent before the, the class is done. But first we need to finish up a few points that are left over from our discussion of the mystic writings of Baha'u'llah. We didn't go through them thoroughly and at all, but we went through some of the concepts and we were leaving off with one of the uh, poems that, uh, well, the only poem actually that is in the book, uh, uh, The Call of the Divine Beloved, which includes the revised version of the Seven Valleys and the Four Valleys and a couple of other works. So these are samplings of some of Baha'u'llah's most important mystical works. So I'm going to share my screen and pull up the... Um, we have a society and it could be maybe worse. The uh, slides for tonight. So this is class 43, an introduction, introduction to the Kitabi Gan. The Book of Certitude. Uh, and, but let's finish off with the Rashima, uh, uh, Rashi Amon, which is uh, the, the clouds of the realms above, because they were, uh, not that the poem is crucial for us to know per se, though it's important, but we're just going to sort of finish off our discussion about symbols and illusions, because we're going to encounter so many of them on every page of the Book of Certitude. Uh, first of all, in that, and this is not the entire note, but on the first page of the poem in the book, uh, The Call of the Divine Beloved, you have an explanation of what are the clouds of the realms above. Well, the clouds of the realms above is a translation of the word Amon. Uh, and uh, uh, the reason I want you to see this is not only because the, it makes the poem make a whole lot of sense, but it also is in keeping with the point I'm trying to finish up with in so far as symbols and illusions and how important it is to understand how they work and how to go about understanding them. So it's important enough where usually there are not many notes in the translated works of Baha'u'llah from the World Center simply because they, uh, and cor correctly so, don't want interpretations of the work included with the work. They want just the work itself. So uh, Abu Baha, in his uh, own discussion of this poem, says, Amma is defined as an extremely thin and subtle cloud, seen and then not seen 
For shouldst thou gaze with the utmost care, thou wouldst discern something, but as soon as thou dost look again, it ceases to be seen. For this reason, in the usage of mystics who seek after the truth, Amma signifieth the universal reality without individuations as such. In other words, without being manifest in an object or in a person. For these individuations exist in the moan of uncompounded simplicity and oneness and are not differentiated from the divine essence. Now that, we could discuss that for a long time. That's not very easy to understand. This in brief is what is meant by Amma. Now the, the note goes on. My point is simply this. As we go through the, the poem, you'll find each verse in Persian poetry has a sejura, which means a pause in the middle, which means that one line in, in Persian is really two, part, has two parts. So, you, of course, you're reading from right to left. So this is the first part of the line, and this is the second half of the line. Now, this isn't from the uh, Rashi Ma. This is a poem of Tahirah's uh, in her own handwriting. Um, but you'll see there's, in other words, each uh, line has two parts. That's the sejura or break. And so when we go to the poem, uh, the clouds of the realms above, which is really the, uh, the cloud of Alma, uh, you see that the first line has this part and then the second part. So each line ends with our raining down. Uh, you have this raining down, raining down, raining down. And of course, it's, uh, it's sort of a rhymed couplet in, uh, well, not a rhymed couplet because it's not rhymed within itself except the first one. Uh, but it's trying to replicate, the translators are trying to replicate in English the, the feel of the poem in the original. Because in the original, you have a version of the verb raining down. Um, the clouds of the rain, realms above then is Amma, and what Amma represents in the most general sense is the source of bounty, is the source of all the things that God uh, sends down to us. So each of these lines has an allusion to some aspect of what comes down from that uh, realm of bounty to us. And we weren't not going to go through all the lines, but I wanted to show you a couple. So it, it's from our rapture uh, that the, the Amma is raining down. So because of our rapture, the bounty to mankind is raining down. Tis from our anthem or song or melody that the mysteries of faith are raining down. And of course, the song is the poem itself. And the hour is probably uh, Baha'u'llah speaking, because he wrote this poem while he was in uh, Kurdistan. Now, what I've done here with this uh, part that's in the cyan color is this is a more literal translation that uh, some friends of mine and I did. Uh, it's on my website, the entire translation, but this was before the, the uh, authoritative version came out. But I just wanted you to see that Literally, it means from our rapture ecstasy, a drop from the cloud of Amma, from this mysterious source, descendeth from the melody of our song streameth the mystery of the covenant. And we tra translated uh, faith as, as covenant and so on. Now, I'm showing you this just to show you the, the, the idea that you've got all of these allusions to both mystical concepts, such as uh, the fragrance, the musk, excuse me, I keep flipping that, the entrancing musk wafts down from the clouds of Amma, uh, the musk of the sweetly scented locks uh, uh, or tresses as we translate it. And it's talking about, again, this is a, a, a frequent mystic image that the beloved's locks give off a, a musky fragrance and musk is, is a very sensual uh, fragrance. Um, behold that mystic truth which from his countenance is raining down. 
uh, and it talks about reunion and rapture, of course, which are very important in mystic poems. Then you get to uh, the treasures of love lay hid within the very heart of Fars. Well, what is Fars? Fars is the province where Shiraz is located. And so this is talking about first you have the uh, uh, treasures that are bestowed by the Bob. Um, and um, th then on the next uh, several lines, you have the, ch the wine imagery we've talked about before. The trumpet blast, which of course is the trumpet call alluded to in the Quran, uh, signaling the day of judgment. Uh, so my point is like you've got here, uh, the day of God hath been fulfilled for lo, the Lord hath been unveiled the wondrous message from the melody of Ta is reigning. Now, what is Ta? That is Tehran. So in other words, you've got on the previous one here, Fars signalizing the Bob and here the melody from Baha'u'llah. Well, it, it, we could spend uh, several classes just on this poem. My point is simply to show you that all of these, th th this poem would be almost impenetrable if you didn't have a way of getting at these illusions. And the particular one I want you to show, uh, show you is the day of I am he is made to shine resplendent from our face. The age of he is he from out our flowing cup is raining down. Well, what in the world is that referring to? Well, this is referring to uh, the a line from the uh, 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 Islamic tradition, uh, and Baha'u'llah quotes it in this passage from the Gleanings. And he's talking about the station of unity of where the manifestation is essentially the closest we will ever come to understanding God or into the presence of God. And so this is a quote, of course, from the Kitab Gan, we'll get to later. So the first station, which is related to his innermost rep uh, reality, represented him who as one, he, him as one whose voice is the voice of God himself. Now, this is the station of essential unity that each of the manifestation occupies. In that sense, they are God as much as we can understand God. And so you have this tradition which says, I am he, in other words, I, Baha'u'llah in this case, am God himself, and he is I, myself. So we're interchangeable. This is very much like what Christ says when he says, uh, why do you ask where the Father is? Have, you not, uh, have I not been with you? He who has seen me has seen the Father, for I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Uh, this is saying essentially the same thing, that they're indistinguishable from our perspective. And, but it goes on to say uh, that, in effect, I am God and God is I, except that I am I and he is he. Now, what does that mean? It means except that I, must, I, I am a particular reality or essence, uh, a particular soul in this case, and God is his own essence. So in other words, effectively, in the state of essential unity, we are one and the same, but the fact, except for the fact that we're not one and the same. I am one essence and he is another. So th there's so much packed into this, uh, but once you understand the essential idea of it, you come across this he is he, and you what is that referring to? Well, now you know what it's referring to. Um, and it goes to this passage that I've showed you so many times, that everything the manifestations uh, do, his acts, his doings, whatever he ordaineth or forbiddeth should be considered in all their aspects and under all circumstances without any reservation as identical with the will of God himself. And this is the loftiest station to which a true believer in the unity of God can ever hope to attain. So once you accept this uh, aspect of the unity of the manifestations um, with each other, and the unity of them with God, uh, you have attained a sense of 
uh, the station of the prophets and uh, what, um, what should I say, obeisance or what respect or what regard with which we hold them. Um, well, there are a couple of others I wanted to see. The Lot Tree. No doubt many of you have seen this, this image, the reference to the divine Lot Tree. Well, what is that? Well, the Lot Tree, its branches, its leaves, its boughs, the Lot Tree represents originally the uh, a place, and this is from um, the Quran, it says, near the Lot Tree beyond which none may pass. The lot tree, as I've mentioned before, was a tree planted at the end of a road to signal that this is as far as the road goes. This is the, your destination. This is the end of it. And it represents symbolically the manifestation himself. So uh, uh, when it's talking here about if you look at the, the lot tree, you'll see the marks of thy sword on its boughs and its branches, its leaves notwithstanding that God created thee for the purpose of recognizing and serving it. So the, obviously this is to do with the rejection of the manifestation, the torture of the manifestations, and, and indeed with Christ and the Bob, the execution of the manifestations and their descendants, the leaves are the women descendants, the branches, the male descendants. Now, again, why am I showing you this? Because once you understand the the full meaning of this, you don't have to re-investigate it. So in other words, the more allusions and symbols that you uh, investigate and understand, uh, the more you can read through the writings without having to stop every sentence and look up something. Uh, so I, I talk about this has to do with the dual concepts of bounty and gatar or garar. Uh, um, and, and I may have misspelled that, it may be garar. Uh, but at any rate, it means uh, portioning out. It's a verb to portion out. And so you have this concept of God is always full of bounty. He, he gives us everything we need. And yet with wisdom, he gives it to us in proportion to what we are able to utilize at any given time. And of course, this is the underlying concept of progressive revelation, that it is progressive, progressively more complete. So uh, this is a, a, um, a well, I'm, I don't know if I want to go through this or not, but th th this is a, a passage from the Quran that alludes to the Lot tree. And I was showing you this two bows lengths or even nearer. Sometimes you'll come across in some of the poetry of Tahire, just the passage are even nearer. And you wonder, what does that mean? Are two bow lengths. This is a passage describing the approach of... Uh, of Muhammad to the angel Gabriel, or Gabriel to the to Muhammad, until they are only two the length of two. Talking about the bow of an archer, uh, so it'd be about six feet or so, or ten feet uh, 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 apart, or even nearer, perhaps even closer. So did Allah convey the inspiration to his the prophet's mind and heart, in no way falsified that which he saw. This is confirming the fact that Muhammad is telling the truth about his uh, description of encountering the angel Gabriel. Uh, now, again, why am I showing you this? So that whenever you see the passage or even nearer or two bow lengths, you know what it's referring to. The moment when uh, the angel Gabriel appears to Muhammad, uh, in effect, when the revelation begins for any of the prophets. So you come across these illusions, and once you've investigated them, they're yours forever. In other words, you now know that Fars, whenever you see that, is representing Shiraz, where the Bab uh, was born, raised, and where he declared his mission. Ta is Tehran, and in some context, it will represent Baha'u'llah. If you see I am he, or simply I am he, and he is he. Uh, you know what that's referring to. It's a talking about this uh, station of essential unity between the manifestation and God. 
Well, that's all I wanted to do with that is simply to finish up that discussion. It's really never finished because we're going to use these same tools about illusions as we go through the book of certitude because there are many symbols and illusions in it. In fact, as you're uh, going to find out, the whole first half of the Book of Certitude is about how to understand uh, scripture that is elusive and symbolic. So let's begin. Uh, now we're going to meet, as I said, every week, every Wednesday at the same time until we're through with the gone. Uh, and we're going to take it in particular sections. So tonight, uh, I'm just going to introduce you to what tools you will need as we go through this and, uh, and some of the descriptions of why this book is so critical, why it is considered the most important work other than the Book of Laws, which is the framework for the world uh, order of Baha'u'llah, uh, in all the writings of Baha'u'llah. And as I say, really the most important work uh, that will be written for the next thousand years. So we would be foolish not to study it and, uh, and study it often. This is the guardian's uh, part of the guardian's description of the importance of it. Foremost among the priceless treasures cast forth from the billowing ocean of Baha'u'llah's revelation ranks the Kitabi Gan, the Book of Certitude, revealed within the space of two days and two nights. Of course, in that sense, that's certainly a proof of the reality or the uh, station of Baha'u'llah. Uh, in the closing years of that period, this would be 1862, the period in Baghdad, it was written in fulfillment of the prophecy of the Bab, who had specifically stated that the promised one would complete the text of the unfinished Persian Bayan, and in reply to the questions addressed to Baha'u'llah by the as yet unconverted maternal uncle of the Bab, Haji Mirza, Mirza Sayyid Muhammad, while on a visit with his brother, Haji Mirza Hassan Ali, to Karbala. So that's, uh, uh, you'll notice, as I said before, so many of the works of Baha'u'llah were written in response to questions put to him by believers, or in this case, someone who's not yet a believer, but wants to know what the answer to this question is. Uh, well, let's begin with what is certitude. Most of you probably uh, know, but let's be sure we're... Uh, clear on why this is such an important subject. It is freedom from doubt, especially in matters of faith or opinion. It is certainty, assurance, conviction, confidence. What you would say would be, say, in the Christian West would be called faith. Do you have faith? Or do you, uh, in the case of, say, a, a Christian uh, fundamentalist, do you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? You know, that assertion of your confidence, your faith, as, as in that, in the words of Christ, as the standard for your beliefs. Uh, so how do we attain certitude? And of course, that's what we, we all want, is to be sure about what uh, Baha'u'llah has revealed, and that we understand it, and that we follow it, and of course, to be sure before you become a Baha'i that he is who he claims to be. And so this book, in one sense, is a proof of what Baha'u'llah at the end of it calls an argument, showing how you can discern the evidence that the prophets are whom they claim to be. So because it is an argument, it is very, very logically structured. And that's why it's, in effect, fun to study, because it's not like that poem we just glanced at, where you have a whole plethora of diverse symbols and images, and you're trying to make some sense out of them. You get the overall idea that God is bountiful, and that he is speaking in mystical terms of the bounty coming, raining down from the cloud of bounty. But the Book of Certitude progresses very logically as step by step Baha'u'llah 
induces certitude in us by proving to us a, a whole a bunch of things. The main focus of it is an apologia, as uh, the Guardian calls it, for the Bob and the Bobby faith. It's the proof of the station of the Bob. But as Baha'u'llah says at the end of the work, it's also effectively a proof for any other manifestation if you use the same standards that Baha'u'llah dis establishes or discusses in this work. Now, of course, you want to get the Egon if you don't have it. Uh, you can read it online, uh, the, the Baha'i uh, uh, online uh, library. Uh, uh, you, you can download it or you can buy it. The, the one on the left is a little more expensive. The one on the right is the pocketbook of version, uh, version of it, which is only $7 through the publishing uh, distribution service, the Baha'i bookstore. Uh, so you can order that tonight if you don't have it. And the reason you might want that one is uh, because this is my one I use to make the outline of the Kitabi Egan uh, when I wrote the book, The Ocean of His Words. And it's marked up like this so I could see where the different sections were. So don't be afraid. I want you to feel <laughs> the same freedom. We sort of hesitate with a beautiful book to mark it up, particularly one that is a, a holy book. Uh, but you need to look at it as a text for the purposes of this course. Uh, and I would like you to feel free to, to mark it up. As I recall, this paperback version here has the same pagination as, uh, as this book here. And that's important because the outline that I'm going to show to you in a minute, that I'm going to give to you uh, as a PDF file uh, to download, uh, uses in parentheses page numbers so you can see where what I'm discussing or outlining, uh, what page it's on. So what, uh, uh, first of all, what is the... Uh, audience and context of the Egon. Well, as, as I just said, it, first of all, it's meant to be an answer to the questions put to Baha'u'llah by the as yet unconverted uncle of the Bab, who met him in Karbala. Uh, but it's also uh, the main audience, of course, that Baha'u'llah is speaking to are the Muslims, because most of the people in Iran and most of the people who he taught were Muslims uh, who were awaiting the Qa'im. And of course, what he's proving in this book is that the Bab is the Qa'im. Uh, and also uh, at the end, the, the Babis themselves uh, who are awaiting the promised one of the Bab, him whom God will make manifest, which of course is Baha'u'llah, but he doesn't say that exactly. He does kind of at the end of this work, but he's writing it in effect as a Babi to Babis. Now it's important that he's writing to the Muslims because he is, he says early, and we'll see that, if you knew how to interpret the scripture of Christ about the second coming, then you would have been able to convert the Christians to Islam because Muhammad fulfills all of those signs and symbols. And I'm going to show you how to do it. And that's what the whole first half of the book is about. His interpretation of what he calls a dewdrop from the ocean of possible passages he could interpret. And, and of course, it's valuable to Christians because He's not only convincing Muslims how to interpret the Christian scripture, but Christians as well. And of course, always the Jews awaiting the Messiah. This is a, a description of the Kitabi Egan from a very nice resource that I will show you in a minute. And that resource is the Revelation of Baha'u'llah, Volume 1, by Adib Tahirzadeh. He discusses the Egan and other parts of that four-volume series as well. But this is a beautiful statement. He says, the Kitab Egan is like an ocean. It contains the innermost reality of religion, and its depths are unfathomable. 
one may read it many times, yet each time new truths and new visions manifest themselves before the eye. Isn't that beautiful? And it's true. Every time you read it, it seems to become a new book. Uh, and that leads us to Mirz Abul Fazl's note about the Book of Certitude, which they discovered, and I think I've mentioned this before, when they were going over his things after he deceased, and they looked in his copy of the Book of Certitude, and he said, as I recall, I'm now reading for the 29th time, there is still so much to learn. And of course, he was considered and is considered one of the greatest scholars of the, the Baha'i faith. Uh, this is a statement from uh, Hand of the Cause, uh, Hassan Balyuzi, who was a, a magnificent historian and scholar, and whose book, The King of Glory, Baha'u'llah, The King of Glory, is the best biography of Baha'u'llah. It is a fantastic work. And here's his, uh, just uh, one statement of his overview of, uh, of the, uh, uh, what the uh, Kitab Gan is about. The Kitab Gan, or the Book of Certitude, was written in answer to questions presented by Haji Mirza Sayyid of Muhammad, a maternal uncle of the Bab, uh, entitled uh, Kal Akbar, the greatest uncle. He and his brother Haji Mirza Hassan Ali, entitled Khali Askar, who would be the younger uncle, were visiting the holy shrines of Iraq in the year 1862. And that would be in Karbala, the shrine of uh, the Imam Hussein. Both of them, during the six short eventful years of the ministry of their nephew, their nephew be the Bab, had stood firm and steadfast in his support and defense, but neither of them had given him his allegiance. So they were as yet unconverted. And so the, they, uh, for two days and two nights, um, they, uh, Baha'u'llah wrote answers, which became the Kitab -e Gan that answered the questions, which were in the work, as you can see here, was originally called the Epistle to the Uncle, but later called the Book of Certitude, because that's what it's intended to do, is to, uh, provide the reader with certitude about belief in God, belief in the manifestations, and particularly belief in the bomb. So what were the questions? Well, there were uh, categories of questions that uh, Balduzzi lists on page 164 of his work. One of them has to do with the day of resurrection. The resurrection. And of course, that uh, we know was the appearance of the Bab himself, and then the appearance of Baha'u'llah is called the latter resurrection. Is there to be corporeal resurrection? Now, this is a belief of most Sunni uh, Muslims and many Shias as well, and that is when the resurrection comes, the dead will be, uh, will, will be raised up and so on. It's very much like the um, interpretation of the second coming by many Christians. The world is replete with injustice. How are the just to be requited and the unjust punished at the time of resurrection? Again, these are the questions the uncle put. The 12th Imam was born at a certain time and lives on. Now, this is the idea of the hidden Imam, that he was hidden away, secluded somewhere. There are traditions all supporting this belief. How can this be explained? Well, of course, it's explained. Uh, by Baha'u'llah in the fact that the Bab himself is the return of the 12th Imam. Uh, the interpretation of holy text. This cause does not seem to conform with beliefs held throughout the years. One cannot ignore the literal meaning of holy text in scripture. How can this be explained? Well, as I said, the whole first half is almost a, well, it is a course on how to understand the holy text. Uh, without ignoring the literal meaning, but showing the deeper figurative or symbolic meaning. And then finally, the last category, certain events, according to the traditions that have come down from the imams, must occur at the advent of the Qayyim. Some, and that's page 165, I should have gone there, 
are mentioned, but none of these has happened. How can this be explained? <clears throat> well, uh, some of these are rather extraordinary and so on. The heavens will be cleft asunder and all of these. And all of these are explained later on by Baha'u'llah, both in the first part and then later uh, as the fifth proof of the second part. Two more books that you uh, might want to have, uh, if not now, then later as you uh, go back uh, over the kitab -e The outline that I'm gonna provide for you and a discussion of the Egon uh, occurs in my book, The Ocean of His Words uh, on pages 246 to 317. Though, as I say, I will, uh, I've downloaded that for you and will provide you for it. Uh, with the slides at the uh, um, posting of this class on Facebook. Uh, and then Hooper Dunbar, a former House of Justice member, uh, wrote a companion to the study of the Kitabi Gan. That's very useful. Uh, and then uh, Sorab Korosh, uh, a very dear friend of mine, uh, loves to get into the intricacies of symbols and illusions, has two volumes studying the, uh, these are self-study notes. And so they, it doesn't pretend to uh, interpret, but it does give you information where you can uh, uncover all of these symbols and illusions. Uh, th this is an authoritative understand. This is what he has discovered, and he's very clear about that. Then uh, the, the book one of the four-volume work by Tahirzadeh, I mentioned the revelation of Baha'u'llah, pages 153 through 197. Uh, Tahirzadeh uh, pretty much uh, gives a brief narration of the entire work. Uh, and very synoptic, but uh, not synoptic, but very uh, concise. Uh, God passes by the passage I read, plus some others, uh, page 139 through 140. This I thought you might like to see is kind of beautiful. Uh, this is a illuminated text. Um, this is not written by, uh, uh, this is not the uh, um, handwriting of uh, Baha'u'llah. I forget whose handwriting it is, but it's beautiful. And this is the first page of the Book of Certitude in the original, which is a uh, Persian. So what is the purpose of the book? This is a quote from Baha'u'llah uh, you know, on page four of the Book of Certitude. To achieve certitude, you must desire it. Cleanse yourself of worldliness and cease regarding the words and deeds of mortal men as a standard for, true un for a true understanding and recognition of God and his prophets. Kind of reminds you, doesn't it, of that second hidden word, Arabic hidden word about justice is depending on your own knowledge and not that of your neighbor. So these are the qualities or attributes or our uh, attitudes with which you should approach this work. Uh, there are two parts to the work. The first part uh, is approximately 100 pages. The second part about the same. The second part's a little longer. Uh, and so I wrote a, a, a brief description here of what part one is. The history of previous dispensations, now this is from Baha'u'llah, demonstrate that while they profess to await the advent of the manifestation of God, they all denied him. Every manifestation has thus experienced the denials, the repudiation, and the vehement opposition of the people around him. The Surah of Hud explains this clearly, and a brief mention of some experiences of the prophets will illustrate the indignities they experience. And of course, he then goes on, as we will see, to replicate much of the Surah of Hud, but in his own words. The more closely you observe the denials of those who have opposed the manifestations, the firmer will be your faith in the cause of God. 
Now, that may seem contradictory, but he will explain what he means by that as we go through the work. The second part, so the first part is dealing with the explication of Scripture, particularly three verses from the book of Matthew, as they relate to the second coming. Uh, part two uh, is more uh, a demonstration of what is a manifestation, what are their, uh, what is their nature, uh, how do we recognize them, and finally ends up with what are the proofs of the manifestation. Uh, so the purpose of these words is to reveal and demonstrate unto the pure in heart that the manifestations who are sent from the spiritual world to educate the souls of men are omnipotent and invincible. Omnipotent, isn't that something? For these hidden gems, these concealed and invisible treasures, in themselves manifest and vindicate the reality of these holy words, verily God doeth whatsoever he willeth, and ordaineth whatsoever he pleaseth. Um, this is, and this will be uh, these last two slides, and then these uh, 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 hot links that will take you to the outline of the Kitabi Gan, and then all the slides we're going to be using for the next several weeks uh, are on that hot link, and that will be the end. So let me just uh, um, read uh, uh, this. This is, um, hold on, let me take some tea. The verses he explicates after he's gone over, uh, listed some of the bad things that happened to the prophets of old. He then on page, um, uh, I think it's about 23, 24, quotes the verses from Matthew 24, 29 through 31. And he says, these are the melodies sung by Jesus, son of Mary, in accents of majestic power in the Rizwan of the gospel, revealing those signs that must needs herald the advent of the manifestation after him. In other words, what were the signs, the proofs that would signal the coming of uh, the next manifestation, which of course was uh, Muhammad. In the first gospel, according to Matthew, it is recorded. And when they asked Jesus concerning the signs of his coming, he said unto them, Immediately after the oppression of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the earth shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. So he's going to spend the first hundred pages. Uh, there's some digressions, and he call, he says, uh, uh, "Digress. Let me get back to this." But it's a uh, it's a, a lovely, lovely uh, discussion, and he's very lighthearted at some places, and very ironic in some places. Uh, so he's going to spend the first hundred pages explaining this simply this these three verses from Matthew. Um, and then this is interesting because very briefly after he said that, he then in Arabic, uh, the, uh, excuse me, he, he is translating this, uh, he's reading this in the Arabic, and then he talks about it in Persian. Uh, and, and you can see the note, and this is from the Guardian. The passage is quoted by Baha'u'llah in Arabic and then interpreted in Persian. So this is his speaking in Arabic, of course, translated into English. And this is what he says is the, over, the basic meaning of these verses. In, per, uh, in Persian, the purport of these words is as follows. When the oppression and afflictions that are to befall mankind will have come to pass, then shall the sun be withheld from shining, the moon from giving light, 
the stars of heaven shall fall upon the earth and the pillars of the earth shall quake. At that time, the sun signs of the Son of Man shall appear in heaven. That is, the promised beauty and substance of life shall, when these signs have appeared, step forth out of the realm of the invisible into the visible. Of course, the kingdom of God come on earth. And he saith, at that time, all the peoples and kindreds that dwell on earth shall bewail and lament, and they shall see that divine beauty coming from heaven riding upon the clouds with power, grandeur, and magnificent, sending his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. Similarly, in the three other Gospels, according to Luke, Mark, and John, the same statements are recorded. As we have referred at length to these in our tablets revealed in the Arabic tongue, we have made no mention of them in these pages and have confident, confined ourselves to but one reference, which he calls uh, one dewdrop out of the ocean. So this whole uh, exercise of the first hundred pages is a dewdrop. So you can imagine uh, if he would, uh, well, he does go on to share others. So this I will show you just very quickly is the outline um, of the uh, whole of the uh, Kitabi Gan. Um, and if you click on it, you will download it as a PDF file, and it will look like this. And so you can see there are major parts. There, the, the page, major part one, major part two. There are eight major parts in the first. Uh, I think it's eight. Let's see. Uh, in part one, uh, yes, eight. That, that's. Part number eight. So eight parts in part one, and in part two, I think there are twelve. Uh, all right, and so you will uh, have access to that, uh, and then you will also have access to this, which are the slides, not just for the, not for this class, which will be separate, but for all of the uh, classes that come after this on the Egon Witten, there are about 130 some slides. Okay, so let me go back to uh, the PowerPoint. We come to uh, the Kibla and we are finished with my presentation. Uh, it was a uh, kind of hurried, but it was again, just an, uh, an overview of what we're gonna do and of the essential ideas contained in the Gitabi Gan and why it's so important.